G'day, I'm Martin Isles, and this is The Truth of It. And today we're going to be talking about cancel culture. Firstly, in the context of J.K. Rowling's letter about professionals that are being fired. Secondly, in the context of Donald Trump's speech at Mount Rushmore about the destruction of historic monuments and statues. And then we're going to turn to the issue of flattening the curve, but not quite the curve you're thinking of. This is the dead curve. But before we get started, I just want to say this. You'll note, some of you, that this is coming out on Wednesday evening, 8 p.m. That is the new time. We were coming out Sunday afternoon, just wasn't quite working from a production point of view. So Wednesday, 8 p.m., there is a live premiere on Facebook and YouTube, and then the videos are available on those platforms, as well as clips that come out on Instagram, and this is also available as a podcast. So whatever platform you use for podcasting, look up the truth of it. If it's Apple, give us a five-star review. Without further ado, let's get started. First up, let's talk about cancel culture. And I mentioned that we will be talking about J.K. Rowling and her letter with other uh, academics and so forth, and also Donald Trump and his speech around Rushmore. But firstly, let's get into this letter. This is, uh, it made headlines in the last couple of days, signed by over 150 writers, academics, and public figures, including such luminaries as J.K. Rowling, as I mentioned, but also Margaret Atwood, Salman Rushdie, Noam Chomsky, uh, you know, a real range of, uh, of, of people from all over the political spectrum, from different countries and all sorts. And the letter really is uh, an appeal to reject cancel culture. Uh, and let me quote the part of the letter with which I agree, which is the second half. It says this, it's, it's very good actually, it says, it is now all too common to hear calls for swift and severe retribution in response to perceived transgressions of speech and thought. More troubling still, Institutional leaders in a spirit of panicked damage control are delivering hasty and disproportionate punishments instead of considered reforms. Editors are fired for running controversial pieces. Books are withdrawn for alleged inauthenticity. Journalists are barred from writing on certain topics. Professors are investigated for quoting works of literature in class. A researcher is fired for circulating a peer-reviewed academic study. And the heads of organisations are ousted for what are sometimes just clumsy mistakes. Whatever the arguments around each particular incident, the result has been to steadily narrow the boundaries of what can be said without the threat of reprisal. We are already paying the price in greater risk aversion among writers, artists and journalists who fear for their livelihoods if they depart from the consensus or even lack sufficient zeal in agreement. Now, they are mentioning here an issue that many people are just flat out aware of. They're concerned because it's really starting to knock on the door in the realm of writers and the, the arts and academia and things like that. It's been going on in many sectors for a while, this idea of cancel culture, that if somebody transgresses a narrow bandwidth of acceptable speech and thought, if they go outside it even once, even as they're saying here, by accident in some cases, then there must be swift retribution. And that is in the form of, you know, we say being cancelled. But, uh, you know, it is, for example, losing your job. It is, for example, losing your contracts. It is, for example, losing your credibility, your accreditations, and all this kind of thing. As in, you think that way, you've said that, well, all right, you're finished. Okay? Now, there's nothing too controversial in that for many people. You know, many people experience it as political correctness and that narrow bandwidth of what they feel they can or can't say. Um, that's how they experience it. But here they are saying, well, actually, you know what? People in our sector are afraid of this now. We're afraid of this. We don't know when it's going to come for us, whether we will say something wrong. They conclude with this, which I think is very good. It says, this stifling atmosphere will ultimately harm the most vital causes of our time. The restriction of debate, whether by a repressive government or an intolerant society. That's a good point, you know. It's not always a totalitarian government that can suppress speech and debate and thought and, and, and that kind of thing. It can be society. An intolerant society or sufficient intolerant people in positions of power in society or institutions that can do the job. It says it invariably hurts those who lack power and makes everyone less capable of democratic participation. They're saying it's a threat to democracy. I'm going to get to that in just a minute. And then they say, the way to defeat bad ideas is by exposure, argument, and persuasion, not by trying to silence or wish them away. So they're saying, look, cancel culture wants to get rid of certain ideas. It's going to fail at its own goal. It's not going to get rid of ideas. You can't get rid of ideas. The best you can hope to do with ideas is rebut them clearly, dispel them openly, and see that those bad ideas don't actually get big time traction. Um, and I think that there's a lot of wisdom in that view. Uh, now, this got a mixed reaction from a lot of quarters. I read a lot of tweets. I read a lot of criticism of it. Um, and uh, the, criti the critics basically said two things. 
Now, they said, firstly, there was the outright denial of cancel culture. It just doesn't exist, they said. It's just a made-up concept by people. Well, I think most of the people who said that are simply disingenuous. Uh, they know that it exists. They know that it's happening. But they're on the right side, and they actually support it. Uh, and so uh, they're not going to call it out. There are those who I think are genuinely ignorant, and that's probably because they actually have these PC views, and that just hasn't entered their orbit yet. But hey, you know... Like I'll say in a minute, that, that was the case for someone like Jermaine Greer. It was the case for J.K. Rowling. Case for others who have suffered far worse fates. Uh, and then one day, wham, you realise that you're outside the permissible boundary. The second thing they said, so firstly, it doesn't exist. The second criticism was that these whiny people must be just whining because there's no fear for them. They have huge audiences. What are they complaining about? Well, you know, and this is one example. There's a tweet by Judd Legum, who's a... Um, a political staffer and a journalist and whatnot in the US, and he says, this letter perfectly illustrates my issue with the cancel culture trope. The signatories of this letter have bigger platforms and more resources than most other humans. They are not being silenced in any way. Well, actually, the way I see it is that these people, they're simply naming a rising trend, which will ultimately threaten their platforms. And indeed, it already does. It's knocking at the door. Uh, that, that is to say that their platforms are not yet taken away from them but they have seen enough cases. They are astute enough to know that this trend is not going away. And this is for many of us with non-PC opinions, just the reality that we live in. We know this. There is nothing whatsoever, even slightly offbeat about what's being said here. This is happening. Take uh, my own country of Australia and where most of the viewers are from. Professor Peter Reid at James Cook University sacked for publishing a dissenting view on the condition of the Great Barrier Reef. Right? Uh, this idea that, uh, that, that, that pushed against the climate change uh, mantra. Or Israel Folau, the one with which I have the strongest personal connection, sacked by Rugby Australia. Why? Because he put a verse of scripture on his Instagram account, and this was some kind of statement of inclusion by Rugby Australia by excluding him and his religion. Uh, and he was, you know, one of their best players, if not their best. Uh, or Drew Pavlo in recent times at the University of Queensland, expelled. Why? Well, because of his pro-Hong Kong democracy protests and things like that. And that's been quite a shameful episode, actually. And these are alongside, those are the high-profile ones, the ones that have been famous or have happened to more famous people, especially in Izzy's case. But there's others that are less famous. And I could sit here and I could cite four dozen examples easily for you, which I might do in another video, actually, just to show you in the last few years how ordinary folks have been cancelled time and time again. You could look at Ian Shepherd, school teacher who was put under disciplinary proceedings for his opinions on same-sex marriage. Or Jason Tay, a photographer who was hauled before a tribunal for sharing his faith with a client. Or Byron and Kira Hordyke, who have been declined admission to the foster care system because of their Christian faith. Or Dr. Jareth Cock, a general practitioner who was deregistered and still cannot practice medicine now for, oh gosh, must be a year just about. Uh, and there's no hope really for him at the moment, it seems, uh, because of his conservative opinions online. Deregistered as a doctor. Or Josh Lawless, a university student suspended for praying with a friend. I could keep going. I won't. But internationally, this is a big deal as well. I'm, I was just thinking of the passing of Sir Roger Scruton recently. He was a luminary. He was a, a man with tremendous academic pedigree, a guy who you'd think, you know, for heaven's sake, don't cancel him. You know, he's, he's, he's too, too important. Well, he faced that in his last days on this earth. Or indeed, this letter itself that I just read to you from these 150 so or so uh, uh, people uh, it has specific examples in mind. So when it says editors are fired for running controversial pieces, uh, well, that'd be New York Times editor, opinion editor James Bennett, forced to resign last month for allowing a piece by Senator Tom Cotton, which said the government should use the military to control civil unrest over Black Lives Matter, forced to resign just a month ago. Or they say books are withdrawn for alleged inauthenticity. Well, that's a reference to a novel, American Dirt, about illegal immigration by someone who was not an illegal immigrant, and therefore there was some kind of weird appropriation debate about that sort of thing, and, and that was a problem. Well, they weren't the same ethnicity of the, the immigrants or something like that. Anyway, you get the drift. There's a whole lot of examples in mind here. And this cancel culture is something that ordinary people just experience every day as political correctness. The restriction on what they feel they can and they cannot say, the culture in their workplaces which demands conformism, the sense of stifling. And you know, I hear people literally every day tell me about this. I'm approached in the street. I, I'm sent uh, messages all the time. This is how people feel. I remember at the height of the Israel Folau stuff, I'd have people coming up to me multiple times a day and saying, thanks for speaking when we can't. Why not? Well, it's this political correctness. It's this cancel culture. It's because they're working in law firms. They're working in financial institutions. They're working in universities. They're at schools. They're doing all of these things. And they fear. We're seeing a growth in a new mindset. 
It's a mindset that says that you will no longer be left alone to believe what you want to believe. That's a big development in culture, you know. It's a change. In recent memory, we were far more inclined to leave people alone with their differences, especially if those differences merely amounted to thought and opinion. But change is afoot. More and more, if you are found guilty of wrong think, especially if you dare to express that wrong think in words, you will be ruined. It might be your job, it might be your reputation, it might be your contracts, it might be your relationships, whatever it is, they'll come for you. Some are high profile enough to survive. You know, uh, I mentioned Izzy a couple of times, so I'll mention him again. I mean, he went through a lot, it was terrible, but uh, you might say that it looks like he's managed to survive. But there's many people who aren't high profile enough to survive. You talk at pe to people who are not within the bounds of political correctness, um, who, uh, for example, uh, had academic university careers or jobs, careers as artists in the artistic world. Uh, I know some of them, uh, and they will tell you that it's cost them their future. It has cost them their future. Now, the signatories to this letter go further, and there's two lessons I want to pull from this. And this is the first. They go further and they point out that this is a threat to democracy, and therefore, the freedoms of the most powerless. And I think that's absolutely correct. It must be correct if you think about it, because if we accept that certain opinions absolutely cannot and must not be ventilated, or certain things cannot and must not be mentioned, even by accident, then nobody can be trusted, especially those who have not been inducted into the right way to think. And who are they? Well, you know, they are what Hillary Clinton called the basket of deplorables, uh, the people who, you know, who, who, who are just ordinary voters who are considered to be ignorant and racist and bigoted and uneducated and conspiracy theory ridden and populist and people who speak their minds and don't think all the sanctified things that one is taught at a sandstone or Ivy League university. Those sorts of people. It's astonishing to me for a movement uh, which is so concerned on, the, on its face about power, boy, they don't seem to take into account the way in which their ideas disempower the most powerless ordinary voters who find their voice at the ballot box. Um, I was reflecting on this recently, actually. Pauline Hanson was, um, uh, she was excluded from the Today Show because she said some things on there which they said were racist. And I haven't had the advantage of watching them, but I'm sure it's an exaggeration. But anyway, um, and I looked, I thought about her and I thought, well, Pauline Hanson's problem is that she's inarticulate. But here's the thing, most Australians are inarticulate. She speaks her mind. Well, most Australians speak their mind. Welcome to the real world. But see, those are the worst kinds of people for the cancel culture types, the more significant people who haven't been taught how to think and how to speak. This is why the Democrats in America want to get rid of the Electoral College, because it silences the voices of the, you know, the rednecks, the people in the country areas. They no longer have the voice that they have today. Now, this silencing of speech is baked into the DNA of left-wing movements. It's affected heavily by postmodernist and Marxist thought because that's a system of thinking that says that truth claims are about power and control and nothing more noble than that. And so if you want to wrest the power off the powerful people, which is what you know, these movements are all about, you need to cancel them, you need to shut them down. There's no other way about it. There's command and control. That's the only solution. Total authority over who says what and where they're allowed to say it. And no platforming is the only solution. Cancel culture on steroids is the only solution because the movements do not believe in any kind of debate at all. Um, this is, it's a totalitarian mindset. Not to say that we have totalitarianism now, but simply to say uh, that uh, this is, that is where it must lead if allowed to go free. Um, and it's interesting, none of these academic and literary figures, it seems, or very few of them are really right wing. Uh, they spend an awful lot of time in the letter bashing Donald Trump. Um, you know, uh, they've realized that cancel culture is even coming for them. Uh, political correctness can come for anyone. Um, and, you know, if, if you're one of these people who says that, you know, there are some things which people may should never be able to say, and that this is a justified response to some of the things that have been said, and some of those cases or many of those cases should have gone ahead, well, bear this in mind. There is no guarantee that you will remain within the ever-narrowing parameter of PC groupthink. I mentioned Jermaine Greer. I mentioned J.K. Rowling. The examples are endless. The boundaries of what is acceptable are narrowing, and everyone is running a risk. That's my first point. This is a totalitarian mindset, and I wouldn't assume that anyone's safe. But here's the other thing which I really like about this, and it is that I think the solution in large part, is effectively what these people have done. Strength in numbers. Um, 
You know, during the Israel Folau matter, the best thing that could have happened would be for every Christian sports person to post that same scripture on their Instagram accounts. Um, strength in numbers. If there's only a couple of snipers, they can deal with one head coming over the trench wall or two or three or six. They can't deal with hundreds. And this is the thing. These PC types are a minority of people. They happen to have disproportionately powerful positions because they've set their life to that end. But my goodness, if we had strength in numbers on any number of these things, they wouldn't be able to do anything about it. They actually rely on us going quietly. They rely on a failure of courage. And here we have more than 150 people standing together. They can't cancel them all. They just can't. There's too many. It's too widespread. I think there's a lesson in that for us. You know, one of the most frequently repeated phrases in the Bible is be strong and courageous. It comes up time and time again. And the famous instance in Joshua where it says, be strong and courageous for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. We need to recover some courage and we need to stand with each other, even when people do things that aren't exactly what we would have done. But for the sake of, you know, some of these issues that really matter, I think there needs to be courage and someone needs to stick their head above the parapet. But when they do, let's set ourselves to more and more be committed to supporting those that do. Because these people, as I said, they rely on a failure of courage. And let us not be that group, which actually were so many. And yet through a simple failure of moral fiber and courage, we would allow this kind of mindset to prevail. All right, secondly, I want to talk about Donald Trump's speech at Mount Rushmore as it relates to one of these key issues of cancel culture. Um, there is a development in the cancel culture world. I talked before about people who are constantly losing their jobs and being discredited and losing their uh, contracts and their academic accreditations and all that kind of stuff. But see, this is spreading. There's a development and it's now moving. And some of you will have seen it. I think most of you will have seen it. It's moving into history, cancel culture in history. We've seen a widespread phenomenon of tearing down statues, renaming institutions, the defacing of plaques and historic sites. Uh, it's been going on for a little while. I think back in 2015, there were calls to rename the Rhodes Scholarship and move the statue of Cecil Rhodes uh, at Oxford University. Um, this is a movement called Rhodes Must Fall. It's been going on for a few years now. Uh, it's probably on the brink of success. Um, that's where, you know, we started to see it come out. Uh, but this sort of thing is now more and more mainstream. The statue of Winston Churchill, for example, in Parliament Square in London in the last few weeks was famously totally encased in a protective box for the Black Lives Matter protests and some time thereafter. Or here in Australia, a statue of James Cook was surrounded by police officers during the Black Lives Matter protests in Hyde Park in Sydney. Or right across America, it's been really widespread in towns and cities in you know, most states. Uh, everyone from a statue of Christopher Columbus to Thomas Jefferson, even George Washington, I mean, Nothing, everything is fair game, it seems. Uh, a Wikipedia page set up to list the statues that have either been destroyed by protesters or vandalized or removed by authorities lists examples right across the West, including the US, the UK, New Zealand, South Africa, Belgium, etc. Um, the question comes, what are we to make of all this? Well, I could talk a little bit about how the erasure of history is a feature of Marxist movements. It makes the tearing down of the present easier if the historical foundations on which the present is built are also gone. And they've been doing that for a while through the education system by completely failing to teach history. And now, of course, they're doing it through, you know, the historical reminders that are all around us. I could go down that line, but I won't. Uh, I actually, others will do that. I want to mention a couple of other things. The first thing I want to mention is Donald Trump's speech at Mount Rushmore. There was open speculation in the media that Mount Rushmore would be next, that Mount Rushmore would be vandalized or something like this. And so Donald Trump went to Mount Rushmore and he gave a speech there. The media described it as a very angry and divisive speech, precisely because it was an excellent speech and they had to put their spin on it. And I'd encourage you to look it up. It's not particularly angry at all. It's actually a really, it's a really good speech. Um, and uh, you know, I don't say that lightly. But he makes a very important point. Uh, this view of history, he points out, is mindless. It's ignorant. It's so monumentally out of touch with the true nature of things and the true nature of these people who have been commemorated in statues that it can only be said that it is a thoroughly ignorant movement. He says this, quote, All perspective is removed. Every virtue is obscured. Every motive is twisted. Every fact distorted. And every flaw is magnified until the history is purged and the record is disfigured 
beyond recognition. And I think he's right. To put a lens over the lives of these men or the periods in which they lived and to purely extract the bad things that happened or were believed in the culture at the time with the benefit of our hindsight, I think is dishonest to history itself. It twists the truth about these times. Um, just like our own time, they were more complex. There was much good in these times and there was great evil, just as there was in every age, including our own. And the point is that those who are born in dark times are to shine the light and stand for righteousness and do good. And they will always, as we do, do it imperfectly and always do it through imperfect lives. But these people, particularly if you focus on these four people at Mount Rushmore, did it far less imperfectly than many. Trump goes on to speak about these four guys, the four men commemorated on the mountain, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln, and Theodore Roosevelt. Of Washington, he notes, he was from a small volunteer force of citizen farmers, and from that, or from a for small volunteer force of citizen farmers, he created the Continental Army out of nothing to take on the greatest military power of the world. And through eight long years, through bitter winters, under-resourced to the point of having no boots on their feet, in the face of certain defeat, they prevailed. Then he returned to Mount Vernon as a private citizen, never claiming power. But he was requested to return to the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia, and he was unanimously elected as president. And after his presidential term, his former adversary, King George, called him the greatest man of the age. Of Thomas Jefferson, he notes that he authored the Declaration of Independence at the age of just 33, one of the greatest documents of human, modern human history. He further drafted Virginia's Constitution. He wrote the Virginia Statute of Religious Freedom. That's the model for the First Amendment in the US Constitution today. And besides becoming Secretary of State, Vice President and President, astonishingly, he was also an architect, an inventor, a diplomat, a scholar, and the founder of the University of Virginia, which remains a renowned academic institution to this day. Of Lincoln, he says, he's a self-taught country lawyer who grew up in a log cabin on the frontier in obscurity. He signed the law that built the Transcontinental Railroad and served as commander in chief of the war that extinguished the evil of slavery in America forever. He issued the Emancipation Proclamation and he led the passage of the 13th Amendment to abolish slavery. His service ultimately cost him his life. He was assassinated on April the 15th, 1865, at the age of 56. Of Roosevelt, Trump notes this. He says he was a police commissioner of New York City, renowned for cleaning up corruption through his tenure. Then he became the governor of New York, then the vice president of the United States, then the president of the United States, all this. And he was only 42, the youngest US president in history. He constructed the Panama Canal. He established many new national parks and is the only person ever to be awarded both the Nobel Peace Prize and the Congressional Medal of Honor. How have we become so ignorant to think that history is just a rolling saga of powerful men sitting around like the guy on the front of the Monopoly box, smoking fat cigars, throwing money around and pillaging and raping and racisting, if that's a word, and laughing at each other about how powerful they are and, you know, just totally immoral people. It's almost become comical. You know, I feel like saying to people, what have you done with your life? If you think that this level of achievement, these kind of guys, come without great cost and sacrifice and arduous toil, then the answer must be that you've done very little because you simply don't know what it takes. These are four great men, men who did more for this world than one in a billion because they believed in service, personal discipline, sacrifice, fortitude, and things greater than themselves. And yes, their faces that are on Mount Rushmore today are faces of sinners. And every statue torn down in recent weeks and months is a statue of a sinner because there are no other kinds of statues. And here's the moral snobbery in all of this, the frankly, the narcissism of it all, the chronological snobbery, as I think C.S. Lewis would have said that, you know, we're enlightened today and we weren't then. Well, if a statue were built, which depicted the sin of your life, including your secret sin, you'd be utterly desperate to tear it down. The mortification and the shame would kill you. What's the difference then with these four men? You know, they are sinners like you and like me. And yet they did a lot 
to tame their sinful nature, to build their character against their sinful inclinations, and do great things which blessed others well beyond their lifetimes. Their statues next to a statue of me or you are towers of virtue because they are sinners and yet look what they did. Jefferson at 33, Roosevelt at 42, Lincoln from total obscurity, Washington, a private citizen who heeded a call. Statues of sinners are the only kinds of statues that exist because we're all sinners, you and me as well. And there's this modern idea that we have an enlightened monopoly on virtue, that we are goodies emerging from this history of baddies. Do you know, if that were true, there would not be such evil in the world today. If that were true, you would not be ashamed of the aforementioned statue of your sin. If that were true, then Jesus would not have had to be cursed and to die for you and for me. But it's not true. And so praise God, he did exactly that. Do you know this realistic view of things? history and yourself, leads a person to say what the Apostle Paul said, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Do you know, I am far more ashamed of my own sin than anyone else's. And that really is the point. Because really, the world is a sinful place. People are sinners. But it falls to us to stand for righteousness and do good in our time as best we know how. And despite our sin, to do good. And we honour and respect those who came before us insofar as they do exactly this. And insofar as we see their sin with the benefit of hindsight, we learn from that as well, you know, because we as sinners need warnings and lessons just as much as we need inspiration and encouragement. I think that was the truth about cancel culture. All right, finally, I want to talk about this issue of flattening the curve. And I don't actually mean the virus curve. I mean the decidedly less interesting curve, but nonetheless more important, well, as important curve, which is the debt curve. You know, to date, the Australian government is looking to incur more than a quarter of a trillion dollars in costs on its economic support package. That's 13.3% of Australia's GDP. That appears to be the highest in the world. It is more than double that of Canada, for example. It is triple that of the UK. And the measures being adopted are are frankly profligate. I mean, you look at a casual on $200 a week before coronavirus, they're now merrily earning $750 a week, um, thanks to the government. And the not-for-profit who posts an income of 15, a mere 15% less than this same month last year, uh, is entitled to oodles of government money um, with no sense of their cash reserves, no sense of um, how they've been doing in the other months, no sense of whether they even need it, whether maybe something happened in the same month last year that explains the 15% difference and it's perfectly normal and fine. We're deliberately, it seems to me, overspending and free falling into debt. And gross government debt is currently about 40% of GDP. The IMF is projecting that we will double that in just 24 months, which is quite astounding. Now, the cry comes back, of course, well, what are we to do? You know, we need to be saved from the virus. And I just have a question. I'm not saying do nothing. I really am not. But I do have a question, which is at what point does the cure become worse than the disease? Business leaders have become openly critical about the approach to the economy. Australian Industry Group Executive Innes Willocks uh, has said parochial state premiers are trying to outdo, outbid and outrace each other to smother any chance of economic recovery. Our responses to the health situation must be proportionate and logical, not hysterical and irrational. And he's saying basically this complete lockdown stuff is really doing more harm than we realise. And I think he does make a valid point. Um, Could it be that we lose perspective? Let me put it this way. If the media posted tables on the front pages, which not only kept up their obsessive focus on the number of new coronavirus cases each day, but let's say they posted tallies of the number of people who have filed for bankruptcy in the last 24 hours, the number of people who have applied for Centrelink in the last 24 hours, the number of businesses that have gone into administration in the last 24 hours, the number of people who have lost their job 
in the last 24 hours or had their hours reduced to nearly zero. The number of addictions revived in people's lives due to isolation. The number of suicides and things like this. Maybe then we'd have a slightly better view of what's really happening. Maybe a more sober view of the costs that are incurred, not just in the health system, not just in infection rates, but everywhere. But see, there's a very modern idea which we've all come to believe. And it's this, it's that the government will and can and should save us. We believe that the government can save us from everything, even climate change, even bushfires, and now it can save us from another incident of life, which is disease, pandemics, and things like that. We look to the government and say, save us, make sure this doesn't happen. It's unrealistic. This is why I think some of the criticism of Daniel Andrews is really over-egged. I mean, he is my least favorite politician in the country or least favorite leader in the country by far. But gee, um, yeah, maybe mistakes were made. Mistakes were always gonna be made. You cannot control every microscopic virus that's floating around in this country right now and however many trillions of them there are. Uh, it's unrealistic. We believe that the government can save us and we punish governments who we don't think are trying hard enough and being earnest enough in saving us, in tipping money you know, out like, like I was just describing it in these crazy measures that are being put together. And so they're forced to act quickly even when their actions are poorly calculated and can't be known, proper, they can't have proper information to make the decisions. And so the government comes in as a savior. The economic shutdown is to save us from the virus. But then all of a sudden we realize we need to be saved from the economic shutdown. And so it's raining money and stimulus. And my question is this, what if they can't save us? What if we're delaying the inevitable? Or what if actually they could save us? They can save us from this particular matter, which is the spread of a virus. But you know what, only by creating problems that are far worse, far more systemic and far more destructive down the line. I already mentioned the immediate debt issue, but there's a bigger issue. You know, in Australia, the immediate debt issue is not that big of a deal, frankly, uh, in, so in its absolute number, 40% of, of, of GDP, all right, we're better than most Western countries. That's, that's the reply you will get so far. But it's the trend that bothers me. It's where all this is headed. You know, the 2008 global financial crisis struck and Australia had uniquely posted a decade of budget surpluses resulting in the repayment of all government debt. And the West responded though, all Western countries responded to the GFC in nearly the same way. And it's called the Keynesian approach. When the economy's on the slide, it means not enough people are spending money or investing in things. And so the government steps in again, the savior, saves us from our own lost confidence by spending up big on lots and lots and lots of stuff. And Prime Minister Kevin Rudd gave nearly every Australian uh, $800 in cash. I was at the uni at the time, so I got about $2,000 in cash, which I thought was great fun. Um, but then the government embarked also on a massive array of nation building projects, not all of which were successful, think pink bats, school halls, etc. But basically it was raining money. And you know something, the coalition went mental. Many of us were quite taken aback actually, because this seemed to be an insane act of economic vandalism to plunge Australia into more debt than the GFC would at breakneck speed, when the future was uncertain, the size of the required stimulus totally unknowable, and the likelihood of ever repaying this money slim because people don't like it when you turn the tap off when you've been giving them cash. And so governments don't tend to have the moral courage to do it. And so, you know, this debt could be a permanent problem. And we'd seen the rest of the world suffering which may, with major debt issues and debt crises. And we're saying, well, isn't this what makes Australia different? That we don't do what they're doing? That we don't go down this line? And the coalition, you know, carped on and on with the same economic message until they won the 2013 election. Well, here are two fun facts. Of the main contributors to the Australian government's gross debt from 1854 to 2020, that whole span of time, the Rudd-Gillard governments of the post-GFC period contributed a massive 37.5% of the total figure. Big. Coalition governments since 2013 have contributed more than 52%. The Rudd government ended up spending, in today's dollars, about $2,900 for every Australian on stimulus measures post-GFC. The Morrison government is on track to spend about $8,000 for every Australian on coronavirus measures. Here is a big change in the past decade or two. Conservative governments across the West have almost entirely given away their fiscal discipline credentials. And you say, well, so what does it mean? Two things. Firstly, the trend 
really needs to stop. The Keynesian approach is all very well, but as I said, we simply don't know how close together crises are. We don't know how much money we need, how well, how secure we need to be, and how big the next thing is going to be, and how soon it's going to be. We don't know how deep the crisis is when we're in it, until we're out the other side. It seems to me that money was just thrown at this thing like mad and too much um, on so many, in so many ways, but quickly, not knowing how long it will last. What if we've overdone it and we need to survive a lot longer? What if, you know, all sorts of things come to mind? Um, we don't know how much to spend. We don't know what the future holds. It's an impossible theory in practice. I remember talking to an economics lecturer at uni and saying exactly that. Great theory, doesn't work. Uh, not least of which because actually governments, you know, once they are zealous and they want to be seen to be doing good and they plunge us into this huge surge of debt, then the crisis passes. Nobody will tolerate austerity and cutbacks. Nobody. And the opposition will always put the government's feet to the fire every time they want to take a dollar off of anything. So the spending never really dries up. And then the next crisis hits. We never had a budget surplus since 2008. Not one. It was supposed to happen this year, but it isn't happening now. And the surge is back on, back into more debt. The trend is bad, which leads me to my second point. This problem is intergenerational. Large sections of the current generation probably won't fully have to deal with this issue because this is a trend that will come home to roost in the future. It is young people who will face the full brunt of unrepayable debt, flat economic growth, minimal superannuation, lower living standards than their parents, trouble with interest rates, inflation, uh, and languishing investment. It's, it's funny because uh, actually I'd say that that's probably the demographic that'd be least interested in this topic, and yet will certainly be most affected by it. You know, it's already the case that many young people, and surveys indica indicate this, don't have confidence that the future is secure. There's no hope in the system. And that's not for no reason. Some of the reasons for that are wrong, but some of them are actually okay, they're not bad because some are valid and this is one. And the long-term integrity of the system looks to many flaky. And it's affecting the psychology of young people, their approach to life. Gone are the days when hard work, a mortgage and 600 square meters of land held a nearly certain promise of a secure life. It just doesn't look like this system is gonna give back in the same way. It's accelerating the youth slide into ideologies that say the system is broken and that there's nothing in it for them. And that's a trajectory that I'm concerned about in my generation, but it's actually the actions of all generations that are in some ways making it worse. And if this path continues, the Marxists will almost certainly have their way because um, it'll be a case of, and, 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 and that, that, that loss of confidence in the system will lead to uh, the kind of destruction that they seek. And so this goes back to my original point, which is, okay, even if the government does save us from the pain of crises like this, What's the long-term cost? Where does it all end? Where does it end up? Are we simply undermining the integrity of the system itself? Now, it won't happen today, this problem, um, but I'm calling it early because the trend is ever clearer. As Nietzsche said, lightning and thunder require time. The light of the stars requires time. Deeds, though done, still require time to be seen and heard. So it's not gonna happen today, but it's on the way. And this is not a question of doing nothing, but it's a question of balance. And my point is this, I think the mindset today, which is to expect too much from the government, which is to be terrified of hardship, which sometimes simply has to come, and which is to be stuck in this Keynesian approach to economic crisis, to spend up big and fast, it all leaves us getting that balance frequently wrong. But like Joseph, wise rulers store up for the future. And you know, it's my hope that a new generation will care about this once again because of where it all ends. Wise leaders do store up, Joseph did, but the foolish squander. And the thing is both approaches yield their own fruits in their time. I'm Mark Niles. And that was the truth of it. Hey, one more thing, you know, I've been looking at the metrics and I figured out something. You guys are watching the videos and not subscribing. So please help us out a great deal by hitting the like button and then hitting subscribe, hitting the bell as well so you get the notifications. It helps us out a really great deal and you can click here to see more videos.